And so it's all recording. Um, so you can go ahead um, when and officially okay, open the meeting. Okay, welcome to the 5.30 p.m. October 7th uh, virtual housing part Northampton Housing Partnership meeting. I just want to give a notice that we are starting at 5.42 and the meeting is being recorded. Um, and so I am going to take a roll call. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Melissa Fowler. Here. Gordon Shaw. Here. Beverly Bates. Please call me Bev. I'm here. <laughs> uh, and Richard and Hannah are not here. And Spencer's potentially on his way, as well as Carolyn, you're here. Yes, as staff. Uh, as staff, yes. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. so the first thing on the agenda is a discussion of a letter of support for Valley Community Development Mortgage Subsidy. Um, and Donna, I think you are here to talk about that. Yes? Yeah, I'm here if you have any questions. Um, I know there's a lot of new members this year. Um, this is pretty much the same program that we ran four years ago. It got approved like right, right after COVID happened. And then it just took a long time because of the whole COVID. But it does involve a mortgage subsidy of 50000 That is a mortgage and a note that will be signed by the buyer by the buyer of the home and um, years one through 15, there is 1% interest, $500 per year, simple interest. So $7,500 total interest year 16 through 30. We will begin to forgive that loan at one fifteenth each year, year 16 through 30. The buyers would after 30 years, owe the city $7,500 under this mortgage and note, we're using the exact same mortgage note that we used in the last round that we just wrapped up a couple months ago. And, um, you know, that's for administrative costs of the town because, hey, cost money to get a lawyer to review the mortgage and note and subordinations and discharges and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the that you know, kind of covers that. That's something that the committee had asked for last time that, um, you know, there's a lot of back end work on these mortgage and notes. But anyway, we plan to meet with around 33 households to discuss this program, kind of gauge where they're at in the home buying process, whether they're eligible for a mortgage, whether they're ready to buy a home, they have down payment, closing costs, savings, they're working on a budget. They understand there's going to be home repairs and it's going to cost a lot. So we're going to work with folks on those um, issues and, and try to get them ready to be mortgage ready so that they can purchase a home in Northampton. It is pretty difficult. Our program, we did have to go into an extension. However, we didn't need the whole lot of time. Thank goodness. But, um, you know, it was tough. It was tough going. It's hard for low moderate income buyers to purchase in Northampton. The prices are really, are really high. There's a lot of competition in the market. There's a lot of people outbidding each other, bidding over the asking price. Um, so, you know, I think um, these first time buyers do need our support and the funds of course can help them, you know, and, and the way the market is now, they're probably going to have to stack one or two of these programs together to be able to afford a house. So mass housing makes available $30,000. I expect the housing bond bill to make some additional funds available for purchases. And we're going to be, you know, trying to connect people with those funds so that they could, um, you know, a modest, decent condition ranch house in Northampton is around $440,000, which is out of the price range of a low moderate income buyer, um, mm. 100% AMI. So these programs definitely help. Anybody have any questions for me? Hi, Donna, this is Beth. Hi, um, I think this is a great program. I think you answered the question, but is 50,000 enough even when coupled with the other programs? 
probably probably <laughs> it's probably not yeah. gonna be, but we're hoping that we're hoping that mass housing will continue offering up to thirty thousand for buyers in Hampshire County to um you know for five percent down in some of the reasonable closing costs. Yeah. And I'm sure the housing bond bill is going to bring back some additional programming. And we also have the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston programs that come out in March, the last week of March. So we try to educate our buyers to stack up these programs to make it work. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Donna. Does anybody else have questions or comments? I just want to clarify, so the last yeah. round, um, CPC uh, Community Preservation Committee did approve the um, same pro program for four. And, you know, the difference between this and supporting other housing is that this just goes to the buyer. It doesn't stay with the unit. It doesn't. Right. So once the money is, is expended, it's essentially gone for a long term yeah. sort of stable yeah. um, housing. but. Yeah unlike other projects that are funded, you know, it doesn't stay with the structure. Mm. This is true. Okay. This is true. It is one and done. Um, yep. You know, I mean, you do get, you do get the 7,500 back or if a person sold in year nine, you're going to get all the money back. But mm -hmm. our buyers, to be honest with you, they tend to buy a house and stay with it. They don't, they're not move up buyers. They're not going to buy a bigger house in five or 10 years. You know, these are middle-class working people um, for the most part, working in grocery stores and manufacturing companies locally. And they tend not to be move up buyers. So they probably will stay with the properties for 30 years. Um, but you do get all the funds back if the house is sold before the 15th year. Okay. I move we support uh, the uh, application. You have a second? I'll second. Thanks, okay. Mayor Gordon. Okay, so I'm going to do a roll call. Uh, Gordon Shaw? Yes. Um, let's see. Melissa Fowler? Yes. Beverly, Beth Bates? Yep. Yes. Okay. Gwen Nabod, yes. Four in favor, unanimous. It passes. And thank you so much. Oh, your great work, Donna. Thank you. And thank you for supporting us, um, you know, continuing to support us year over year. We appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. You folks have a great night. Have a good night. Okay. Just so a process note, um, Gwen. Um, um, I, to to get to Donna, you um, we skipped over public comments, so you might want to see if there are any public oh, comments other okay. than what's on the agenda, and right. then um, you could opt to move minutes till after the conversation with the counselors because that can go anywhere. But I um, just thought maybe you want to see if anybody has public comments. Uh, so, if anyone has public comment. Um... Please speak up. Everybody I'm just here me? to listen. Okay. I'm here to listen. Okay. Thanks, Benjamin. All right. Okay. So uh, next for discussion is the meeting format. Uh, we're discussing whether we want to start officially going every week hybrid or keep it as remote. How does everybody feel about that? It's easier for me coming because I work in Springfield. I'm still in Springfield at this time. Sometimes it's hard for me to get back to Northampton by 530 some days. Sure. And for example, today I had back-to-back -back meetings. I had a meeting that just ended at 530 on yes. another Zoom that I, so I wouldn't have been able to make it in person if we had this in person today. Okay. Are you looking for the option of going um Hybrid. Both hybrid, like both in person and remote. Is that what you're what you're suggesting? Yes. People would just have the option. Yes. I'm certainly in favor of um 
I have no issue with that. If people want to get together in person, sometimes, you know, that's pretty nice. If the others are, you know, aren't restricted by that. Um, didn't, wasn't the last meeting hybrid? Yeah. 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 yeah so sure. I'm just wondering for those who were in the room and those who were not, did you find it more clumsy, less clumsy, about the same clumsy as doing this? Well, I thought it was kind of exciting. Um, that was my first official meeting ever since serving in the city that I've been in City Hall since, you know, I started serving like a little into the COVID. So um, I personally enjoyed it. Um, it was good to get out of the house. But I don't know how it, it was for people who were on the Zoom. It's always harder for people on Zoom when the people when most of the meeting is in live in front of you. It's hard to hear sometimes. Um, so right. it's a little bit clunky. I will say that I'm not a, I am not opposed to doing in person. In fact, up until COVID, and I, I've been on this committee for over 12 years. It mm -hmm. always was in person. We just invented that as a result right. of COVID. We figured that we figured all that out as a result of COVID. And so if uh, if you decide that you want to keep it always in person, then I, I could try. I mean, I can make an effort to get there. It's just that actually the last two meetings, I was not I would not have been able to get there by 530, given my work day. But I used to make it. I'll just okay. add my voice. Um, it's not about work, but I am often somewhere else, especially mm -hmm. in the summer. So it would inhibit my participation, but that's not necessarily reason to do it. I'm completely comfortable with going hybrid. I think I ju just want to agree with what Gordon says. I, I find hybrid to be uh, more of a uh, thing I watch when right. I'm remote than uh, feel. But I think maybe we can practice more about making okay. that easier. Okay. So it's almost like a 50-50 feeling about this. Um, and what I'm thinking is, you know, we could just continue to the discussion to the next meeting if we wanted, or um, just to get more input from people. Um, how do you guys feel about that? I, I think you're hearing that uh, hybrid's okay. Hybrid's Let's okay. See if we can make it, make it work, right? Okay. No, I don't know. Do you have a preference, Gwen? You're, oh, you, um, you, you said you like getting out of the house. Well, I like having the choice. I like yeah. having the choice. Um, and I think that um, it's good practice to to go and try to go in person. Like for me personally, um, it doesn't, I'm not speaking for anyone or everyone here, but you know, that's just my thought. I, I would like to go hybrid. I think it would be cool to go hybrid. So if somebody um, wants to I would just say, you know, you could, what you could do since we are missing to, um, three members, you could um, wait to bring it back up at the next meeting um, and, and hear from the other three who are not here um, and, and then make a decision at that point as well. So today wasn't really slotted to make a motion anyway. We were just going to have a discussion about it. So um, is anybody interested in, sh can we shelve this to the next that's fine. Next month? Okay. Is let's see, do I have to do a roll call on that or no? Okay. Um yeah, we can I can just make a note to put it on the next agenda. That's fine. Great, thank you. Okay. So um okay, so now this says a, a follow-up from September 9th meeting. Um, uh, with the mayor, Mayor Shara, and work program agenda ideas, uh, regulatory accessory structure zoning changes. Councilor Elkins is here to discuss that. And then we're gonna talk about workforce housing zoning changes and, and the process, um, uh, what's involved in developing a WHSTA plan. It outlines the geographic boundaries and characteristics uh, to make it sustainable for affordable housing, um, the need to have a developer lined up to complete the plan, and if there is no developer to continue with the draft plan, and then um, presenting the plan to the city council to get it approved, and then 
Um, this would take effect July 1st of fiscal year specified in the agreement uh, and can last for two years during construction. So I think right now this is where uh, Marissa and Alex can speak up. And hello, Alex. Thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Great hello. to see you. Thank you. Who who wants to go first? <laughs> Oh, Let me I'm make you guys um, co-host too. I don't know um, if that's necessary, but um, I think um, maybe I'll just also acknowledge that um, um, this was sort of, um, I'm thankful that both of you counselors can be here. We just sort of put this together at the end of last week and so I know that um, Councilor Jarrett, you had had a conversation um, maybe a couple of months ago with the partnership, but um, I'll just sort of leave it at that as the work that you all have been doing. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so uh, Marissa uh, Elkins and I have been working on an ordinance thinking about how we can get historic accessory structures uh, to be preserved. And one of those ways um, and, and to provide uh, more residences, more um, <clears throat> second units on a property. So there's a number of historic accessory structures. So we're thinking barns, uh, carriage houses, out other garages, other types of outbuildings that are too close to the property line to be currently developed into, for residential use. <clears throat> um, and uh, so we wanted to come and, and hear your thoughts um, before we go and submit a proposal to the council on, you know, what are <clears throat> your thoughts on that and on what are the things that we should be thinking about um, <clears throat> as, as we're thinking about bringing this forward. Um, <clears throat> so there's all sorts of, of different thoughts, like what, what year would count as a historic ac accessory structure and um, what about, you know, what will, what would the impact be on neighbors who have this building that's currently not a residence that's very potentially very close to their property line and, um, what, what impact could that have and other things we could do to mitigate that impact. So, um, yeah, we'd we'll love to hear your thoughts and, and Marissa, would you like to, uh, add yours? Um, sure. So to start off with, to give a general, and first of all, thank you for inviting us and, and, uh, hearing from us. Um, I actually think that this, um, I know that you've been talking to Alex, um, some and, and, and wanting, um, to find some more ways, um, to get involved. And I have some thoughts on that. And I think this is a great piece of legislation to, to begin that conversation or begin thinking about how we might, or council might, include you in our processes more um uh as as part of our process as far as this specific um legislation goes um in order to think in thinking through and I, we'll just for right now talk in 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 general about some of the concerns that we are hoping the legislation will address um but so you have non-conforming buildings it is already the case that somebody can take a non-conforming building and change its use, but not necessarily to residence. So somebody can take their non-conforming building that's a garage and make it a studio or, um, or uh, you know, just, but you can't do the thing to add the kitchens and the bathrooms and to make it a legally, a legal residence. Um, so kind of what we've worked through in terms of the specific language is things like, not changing the footprint um, of the non-conforming side. Um, we've talked a lot about um, what windows could be added on the non-conforming side and uh, and then also try trying to be thoughtful and think through. And we talked to the um, the building inspector, I think that's the right title, um, about um, building codes and sort of if we make a requirement, so for instance, one of the things that we're thinking about is like a um, you can't add new windows to the non-conforming side um, unless they are um, 
high enough to be um, so that, you know, you're not in a situation where you're looking, looking around directly into somebody's backyard or into their home in a way that you weren't previously. Um, and, um, and that if you build up, you can't, if you build up, you like, you can't add up um, in a non-conforming way. So if a, if a non-conforming structure, you know, crosses over, the um the setback line that you can add a second story but but the second story that you add has to um comply with the set with the legal setback does that make any sense so you'd end up with kind of a, like a two level um um building so um it, so hopefully this doesn't sound all too weird and vague we're, we're really trying to think through um ways that um it can be used the other thing that we found um as we were looking around at other structures in this in the city, a there's an, a, already a lot of buildings that people have converted um, illegally, frankly, um, to to some form of residential use or added sort of um, um, uses or kitchens that don't necessarily comply with building. Like, and so they can't rent it. They're not supposed to rent it. They certainly can't Airbnb it, um, and that. That also, so that also has the effect of we have structures in the city that aren't necessarily safe for housing, right? So our goal also would be to um, to make it possible for people to update these historic structures, make them safe. Try we're trying to write the ordinance in a way that um, um, allows people to bring things into compliance, and also if things in, were built in the past in unsafe ways, um, we've we've tried to to build in some some provisions that say that like you, you if you if you built an unsafe addition unpermitted addition that doesn't combine with building code like that's not something that you can that's not part of the footprint you can keep um and correct me alex if i'm if i'm sort of describing any of this wrong in its specifics but so those are the general things that we're talking about is like increasing Increasing residential use, uh, you know, converting these to residential use, bringing um, previously converted um, buildings um, into sort of into compliance and making them legal and and more important than legal safe, um, and uh, and then also um, we're thinking through what what criticism or or what concerns people might have about um, sort of. Um, the privacy issues or the changes and what is on their on their um, property line, um, and what their next door neighbors could and couldn't see, and all that kind of stuff. We're also thinking through parking. So, um, so that was a lot of words to describe some <laughs> legislation. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So what what. What caught my attention and what threw me initially was you used the word historic structures on the property. I'm just, and you may have answered this, but it's just one, why is this needed? Why isn't the existing accessory dwelling zoning re requirements cover this? And it's because these buildings are uniquely situated uh, often there and they would not otherwise meet approval in a regular sort of accessory dwelling zoning change. Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So yeah. okay, uh -huh. and maybe to describe in more um, detail, sometimes it's not uh, the nuance isn't always or the differences aren't always clear to people. But these are structures that were built purposefully for housing um, horses and carriages and cars and That's things that were not factory. residential. Right back there was a broom yeah. factory. Back in okay. <laughs> right. So those and and we allow and have historically allowed those. Well, I think the pattern of development was to push these accessory things away to be sort of subservient to the principal use of the residents on the property, and so as such, they are closer to property lines, and so we have allowed since. 1975, it's been codified that those kinds of structures that um, house, you know, um, studios or cars and things can be as close as four feet to a lot line, because the fo the purpose was not 
to house people, it was to house stuff. And so that's why they're non-conforming in a residential use context. Um, because for a house or residence, you, the setbacks are greater from the lot lines than for something that's accessory or ancillary to, yeah. to store stuff. And so now this would be rethinking um, those um, structures and what their uses could potentially be. And if I can add one other little piece of information, which is part of the the new um, the historic plant conservation plan, and we don't that we don't, we're not really think well, I I think it's fair to say that we're not really thinking of this and the historic conservation piece of it is is not the primary driver for me. I don't think, I don't think Councilor Jarrett, I don't think Alex would say that either. Um, it's more about getting housing, more housing opportunities. That being said, part of the, the, the recently adopted historic conservation plan, like there's efforts going to catalog and I, and I identify various historic structures, um, as part of the plan, um, that, and it it kind of just happens that that's going to fall that that I think that's something the CPA is CPC mm -hmm. the Community Preservation Act, Commission yeah. right uh, Commission is looking at at maybe funding a project to index that stuff and it'll I it it's just a nice bit of timing uh, I I think that that's that that that's lining up to potentially um, line up with with the ordinance that we're we're working on. Um, because we have all kinds of crazy, I mean, I joke about, so that's my neighbors, by the way, I'm not writing <laughs> legislation that affects my, right. <laughs> my property at all, but, um, but like I've, I know people who have an ice cream factory in the back of, of, of their house, or what was an ice cream factory in the back of their right. house on, on right. uh, uh, Massasoit, you know, um, right. and kind of all through these old neighborhoods, there's really interesting, you know, carriage houses and things that in right. different iteration of Northampton fulfilled all kinds of interesting purposes. And, and I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, <laughs> the, um, one of the things is, that is a conundrum for, for property owners who have these spaces, you know, these kinds of uh, buildings on their lot is that they, they can't make them residential. They, um, are of limited use. They're often old and in need of repair, but the incentive to put a bunch of money into something to preserve it um, as a structure is not, is not great. You know, like there's, there's, and so a lot of them are left to be derelict. They become unsafe just on their own merits. Um, and then there is a historical loss to say nothing of the, the, that it could potentially be housing that, um, sure. that both the property owners and the community that property owners want community, the community needs. Um, so I have questions. Okay. Um, the first one is probably for Carolyn um, in terms of feet. So um, in this case, some of these could be, you know, as low as four feet close to the line, but what is the norm or does it depend on the ward or the street or the, the layout of the land? Sure. So by the setback, the minimum setback distance is done by district. So if you look at by zoning district, so in um, the zoning districts that are closer to downtown and um, foreign center um, allow um, detached um, garages and accessory structures to be as close as four feet. As you go further out, the setbacks are 10 feet. Um, but there are, uh, there's a whole range within that, you know, structures that were built 1900 and earlier might be right on the property line or right. one foot. And so there are some of those, you know, significantly sturdy structures that were built in the um, early 1900s or before that might be very close and they might be very big, you know, structures. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but we can't treat um, you, we can't treat those structures differently from other ones if we're sort of classifying them as historic. If they are closer, you know, one foot 
versus four feet, you sort of, you have to have a uniformity of um, these rules. And so um, that's why there inevitably would be variation on um, the setbacks for many of these structures. Okay, and then the second question is, for homeowners that want to do this, I'm thinking about resources. Um, you know, a lot of people are aging, they'd like to age in place. This could make it more likely that they could age in place if they had some kind of a sort of, you know, an income, a rental income or something. Um, but I'm also wondering about like um, resources that people might be able to find um, to, like if this is part of historical conservation, you know, are there things that people can tap into or something like that if they wanted to do this? Um, it, I assume that's for me as well. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I think <laughs> it sort of depends. I mean, one of the benefits of, um, I mean, there could be, um, there wouldn't likely be sort of local CPC money for historic preservation of these private structures. Um, but the, um, the, there might be um, bank financing that would support the rest renovation, knowing that there may be some income. You know, if you have now two units on the property, that might put you in a better position to obtain okay. financing to make those modifications because you can then show, oh, well, I have an extra unit now. I can gain some income from that. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? No? Yeah. Um, is it um, required or assumed or any of the ab above uh, that people rent these spaces? Or is it equally possible that they would just have more livable space in their property? I don't think we would have any requirement that it yeah. that it be that it be rented, um, yeah. <clears throat> but it enables that. And typically, when you're putting in a, a big investment, you're going to use it for some purpose, whether that's a relative living with you or renting it out. Hmm. Yeah, I, it was my presumption that even if you wanted to, you wouldn't have a mechanism. Uh, that was easy by which to do that. I'm I'm wondering if there's other experience, either from the non-historic world or from other places that have done this. About I can I can think what, of an example. <laughs> the the question is, you know, what is the outcome? Do people just have bigger homes or a place for the kid that you really don't want living with you? Um, or does it increase the net number of rental units? Well, you're already permitted to to convert a space like this to a studio, for example. Um, so it's it's it it's an it can be an essentially an addition to your home, even though it's physically separated. So that's already that already happens. We've certainly, as we walked around to various neighborhoods, we've certainly seen examples of this. Um, I'm sure Carolyn could tell us of many, um, <clears throat> but. The, so what we're allowing is for it to be a separate unit, a separate residential unit. I so I think that that, yep. that that allows for for more options than just expanding your mm -hmm. your single family. Yeah, I tend to think of it more of the, you know, every legal, um, every, you know, legal residential place, whether it be an ADU or a, a, a two family by right or whatever, you know, is it, is it, I think it's frequently going to be the case that the first, the, pro the first property owner that does it is going to be the, you know, the single family homeowner who does it for the kid or for the parent mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. I, I mean, that's the reality of it. Uh, uh, and that's, but it, it, it is, it then becomes a unit that's sure. always has the potential to be, um, you know, a, a rental on the market. So, whereas a studio does not, or at least does not legally. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, where we're at. ADUs kind of fall in the same category for what it's worth. Uh-huh. Yeah. Melissa. Right. Melissa. Um given I, I think it's a great idea. Um and given the number of folks that have been coming um, before us for ADU approvals and second structures on their home approvals, I think this would be popular popular with those people that have 
this structure in their yard that is potentially a beautiful older structure that they just don't know what to do with. So whether they're going to use it for their kid or their parents or rent it someday, um, I would suspect that we'd see a lot of people interested in this. So my my question, and I'm sure you've all, you already mentioned it, is, you know, are you thinking that you're putting some sort of um, um, age res restriction on it? Like uh, it has to be X amount of years old? Oh, sorry. That's what I meant yes. by that. Like yeah. it has to be... <laughs> Like it has to be plus. 50 years yeah. old. Years old. <laughs> Senior housing only. That's, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. No, uh, I, you I, know, I, I mean, otherwise we've got all these uh, garages that are all over the city that are up against the property lines that, you know, obviously that's not what you're after. Um, well, right now the, the number where we're, I feel like I'm talking over Alex knows all these things too. We're, we're talking, we're, we're thinking we're working with 1975 because that's when the uh, sort of modern, um, zoning started. It is. It is also the year that both Alex and I were born. So it was a very good year uh, <laughs> in history. And uh, so, but I don't know, Alex, if you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, we we we're kind of following the historic uh, preservation plan as well, which which mentions that year. Um, <clears throat> and if they're doing the survey that they're doing, would would be about. Is that right, Carolyn? It, it, mm -hmm. It's for all accessory structures, which they think there might be some 3,000 of them mm -hmm. throughout the city that are pre-1975. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that, that's the year we're, we're thinking of introducing with. Okay, so... And that corresponds you... with... Sorry, I was just going to say that corresponds with sort of that 50-year timeline that, that, that historic preservation... Um, planners think about as the horizon to think about protecting structures that are um, older than 50 years. Mm -hmm. So um, that that that's another reason that the, the Historical Commission is interested in sort of beginning that assessment and jumping from the plan that was just adopted. So, Okay. So I'm imagining like some old carriage house and you walk in and it's very like groovy girl style with plush rugs and disco balls and <laughs> exactly. Um I, I I love the idea. I think it's a great idea. Um I don't know if anyone has anything else to ask or comment can, on about this. I can add. Um okay. so one of the concerns that we hear from often is also about um, trees needing to be cut down for new structures. And so um, adding <clears throat> adding this as an option where you're you know preserving a historic structure and probably not needing to cut down very, at least not very many, because you have this existing structure, even if you're expanding mm -hmm. a little bit, it's not like you're doing a disturbance of an entirely new structure. So it allows for, for development without as much disturbance. Sure. And um, that leads me actually to something else I was thinking about is in terms of plumbing and stuff like that, you know, what, what, what do you, um, I mean, I guess it would depend on the site. Um, each site would be different, but um, you know, what would be some of the, I mean, I know we have standards, um, but like, what would be some of the, uh, like, this would never happen type of things. Uh, well, I, that's harder to answer. Uh, I'm I'm not well. I'm not exactly sure how to answer that, except for to say that I think a lot of the principles underlying this are the same principles that underlie our zoning changes to make two family by right, um, or to allow conversion to two family without you know okay. uh, by by right and ADUs, which we, isn't even a thing in Northampton anymore. ADUs are not you know because we have two family by right. So um, I it basically it's infill development and it's and it's um prioritizing yeah. you know, density on existing infrastructure so i think the presumption is the other thing too is a lot of these structures for various reasons already have um are already going to have utilities going to them uh i okay. mean yeah yeah i mean the vast majority of them certainly have uh, i'm i'm guessing all, almost everything's going to have electricity and 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 we're not talking about like you you have a chicken coop and you can use that as the basis then to like build a Taj Mahal next year, yeah. your, your neighbor's uh, yard. Like that's where we're trying to write it so that that's not, 
what it is. We're talking about existing structures that start out of a of an of a a, mean, a, a reasonable size to make into a residence, um, and and then just allowing for that to happen. It is not we. It is not meant to shoehorn in, um, you know, something on something a structure. No. Right. No, 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 no neighbor ever systems. looked at and thought, oh, no that's someday is going to be or a anything house. like that. Right. Yeah. So. Well, you could conceivably, I mean, the septic system is an important question. If you're on city water and sewer, then you just run a line, line from your existing uh, house. But if you're on a septic system, then you have to show and you're adding additional bedrooms, you do have to potentially add to your septic system. And so it may not be as as doable in the the areas of town that aren't on city water and sewer. I don't know, Carolyn, how often that that's a concern for folks when when they're trying to expand. Yeah, I'm, I mean, they do have to run the, you know, the do the test, um, get the sign off from health department for their septic system. Mm -hmm. However, I think in um, the number of units that are non-conforming, probably in those areas that don't have public um, sewer, are probably limited anyway. Um, those lots tend to be larger um, and sort of fewer far between um, that might be on septic. And so that might, you know, those two things might not intersect as much. Okay. And for what it's worth, I mean, anybody, if you're on septic already and you just want to do an addition and add bedrooms or second story i mean you have to do the test you have to it's the same test right it's the same, yep. you have to mm -hmm. yep. the same capacity okay. so Great. Um, um so it's a good it's a good question it's something i think that'll affect folks on the sort of outlying areas right. a little differently than it might affect those of us you know folks who are on on city city water and sewer so i have to go pick up a kid um i, so I also have to run um, but if, if you have any other, you know, feel free to reach out to us individually. Um, we'd be happy to talk more and, um, <clears throat> yeah, happy to hear your thoughts. And, and once Great. it's, once we've, um, <clears throat> introduced it, we'd also like to be interested to hear. Yeah. yeah. I'm willing to hear Ben's question if, if he can be quick. Yeah. I can be quick. Uh, thanks. I'm just, I'm curious about the, um, like the windows and the need, the sort of like preemptive concern about privacy for neighbors. And I guess I would just say like, um, you know, I don't think people want people looking out at them and their property any more than anybody wants the people next door looking in on them. And so that's why we have shades and blinds. And, and I just, I'd be, I'd be concerned about like the window um, not being able to put in more windows, like if you had a, a structure where like allowing light in from uh, the side that is the non-conforming side would be really beneficial, to not be able to do that might prevent that project from happening. And I just don't know, you know, I mean, I, I think also I've been, you know, I've seen planning board meetings where people were concerned about people looking in their windows from a new house that was going in, you know, 300 feet away. And so it's just sort of, right. seems like that's kind of a knee jerk reaction that in reality probably isn't, you know, no one's gonna stand in their window and stare at you. <laughs> like that's just, right. And if they wanted to, they could already do that from the garage. Right. Which would probably be even creepier. So I just think, uh, <laughs> maybe I don't think right. it's a necessary thing. I think there's ways to, you know, that people just do. I have shades up on my windows right now or down on my windows now because it's evening and, you know, uh, but I just wouldn't be concerned about that. It just doesn't seem like <laughs> something that's necessary. Skylights. That's all. Skylights are a good thing. I, well, I would say that, so sure. we're anticipating it'll be a concern of some people. And so we have thought through some language and some potential solutions to that, whether or not, you know, we start out the gate with that in the ordinance, I think it remains to be decided, but we have thought through it. And I think there are solutions to address that concern that also allow light. There's also concerns about um, egress. The, the building codes require, you know, egress on certain sides and where you can put um, 
um, but um, bedrooms and and where are their windows. So I, I'll respectfully not take umbrage with you calling it knee jerk. Um, <laughs> um, ben and I talk, we it's fine. Um, but um, but I, I, but you're right. I mean, our first concern is the housing and the ability to to make this work for people who want to do it. And then, but I do think that there are solutions that we have thought about um, that as as this goes through the process um, about windows, we've talked a lot about windows with this this ordinance um, mm -hmm. and, and where where that might go and potential solutions. So it's a good question and and housing is the first priority for us anyway. I keep speaking for Alex, which I don't mean to. So, and now I really have to go. <laughs> all right. Thank all you. Right. Lovely to seeing you all. I'm sorry it's Thank taking you, me so Alex. long to get to one of yes, your meetings. Great to so see you I'll all. I'll come back again great. sometime. Be in okay. touch. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Okay. So that was a good discussion, Bev. Yeah. Um, I had given you a head up, heads up, Gwen, that I have to leave at 6 30. So I just okay. reviewed the agenda again. I don't think we're voting on anything else, right? Um, except for the minutes. Shall we do that? We can do the minutes now if if people want to do the minutes now. Um, I did move anybody that we uh, approve the minutes from September 9th? The second. second. Okay. Okay. So roll call. Uh, Beverly. Hey. Beth Bates. Aye. Okay. Melissa Fowler. Yes. Gordon Shaw. Uh, yes. Gwen Nabad. Yes. The minutes are passed. Okay. Thank you. So I think we lose quorum if, when Bev signs off. So yeah, just, I'm really we, sorry that okay. I just want to compliment Carolyn and 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 uh, Gwen. It's the the agenda is great. I I think it perhaps was a little ambitious, and I hope some of the items can maybe <laughs> flop over onto the next meeting because it's it's uh, all important. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. All right, Bev. All thank right. You. Thank you. Good to see you all. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, Carolyn, you are muted. Yeah. Um, okay. I was just going to say, yeah, it was, um, I wasn't sure how long the conversations were going to be, obviously, but I think it makes sense. I mean, we don't have quorum now, so we can yeah. definitely just Able. wrap that into the November agenda to start where we Wait. left off, if that works okay. for people. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. Great. So, um, so everything that's left on the agenda at this point, we will move along. Um, you know, these are, these final, these final things are going to take, take up some discussion, I think. So, and yeah. I would love for everyone to be here for this stuff. So, um, with that, I am thinking that there would be just one final motion. Which is? <laughs> Can I get a motion to adjourn? Ooh, adjourn. <laughs> Is there a second? Oh, we have we don't have we don't have can't, we can't vote on it. So we, do it. we just have to sit here until next month. Yeah. <laughs> the so, camera explodes. Well, um, I think it's uh, by acclamation. Yes, we are adjourning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right. Six thirty. Okay. Six thirty. Right. November November fourth. It looks like yes. 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 Okay. The day before election day. Doomsday. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great okay. night. Bye. Bye. Thanks.